Welcome to Mr. Giant Reacts a Ting, a Ting, a Ting. I'm Mr. Giant, and we're back with another one for all you and Ting, you know. And this one is called Someone Suggested Again that I watch this. Keep them suggestions coming, man, because y'all are suggesting some really cool stuff for me to watch, and I'm going to keep watching them. This one is called Seas of Vienna Opening Bombardment. And the suspense has already uh, been peaked in me. So let's go ahead and YouTube and, see, and Sim Simmer. See what the Seas of Vienna is. Never heard of it before. Let's check it out. Before we get started, we wanted to say something about these episodes. This series was in production when we found out about the horrific terrorist attacks in Christchurch, New Zealand. And we were sickened to see that the killer's online manifesto, and even their weapons, referenced the Siege of Vienna. We at Extra Credits condemn racial violence absolutely. Period. And when we put this topic up for vote, we did so thinking an honest reading of the event would help undercut disingenuous readings of it as some death match between Christianity and Islam. The truth is far more complex, and as always, we want to combat bad information with good. And while we already plan to say all of this in our lives episode, given recent events, we wanted to make that explicit up front. In the description below, we've included links to relief organizations we've donated to helping the victims of the shooting. And if it's within your means, we urge you to do the same. Please be good to each other, look after your neighbors, and do all you can to make sure that hate has no place in our society. Thanks for listening. On to the show. July 7th, 1683. Emperor Leopold heard mass that morning, continuing his normal schedule as if enemy troops were not loose in this country. The head of the Holy Roman Empire and defender of the faith may have been bookish, but he was also calm in a crisis. A courtier arrives. News from the field. The Turks have broken out. Dust from their march rising in great column. Tartar horsemen are ravaging the only troops blocking the advance. An Ottoman army is headed for Vienna. Leopold can't stay. His sons are both below the age of five. His wife, pregnant. And his closest heir, the King of Spain, lies on his deathbed. Huh. He makes the sensible decision to run. So that evening, a convoy of fine carriages pulls out of Vienna. Over a hundred thousand Ottoman troops are heading for the city. But only 15,000 men defend its walls. They have only six days to prepare. How long can they hold? But this siege began as an idea in Istanbul over a year before. Mehmed IV was a student of history. Like Leopold, he loved nothing more than spending his days in the palace library, poring over accounts and records of the empire. It helped him understand his country's history and where he stood in it. He'd read how in 1453, his predecessor, Mehmed II, had conquered Constantinople, the great city of Istanbul, where he now ruled. When his ancestors did that, they had become the inheritors of the Roman Empire by right of conquest. Among his other titles, Mehmed was Caesar of Rome. But a year before that conquest, an Austrian duke of the Habsburg line rallied enough support from the elector counts to get crowned as Holy Roman Emperor. There couldn't be two heirs of Rome, and to the Ottomans, these German kings were pretenders. Mehmed knew that since then, the Ottomans and the Habsburgs had battled for supremacy, expanding towards each other as the Kingdom of Hungary, which separated them, fell apart. Now that land was a mixed frontier of Ottoman and Habsburg forts, as much Western Asia as it was Eastern Europe. Mehmed read how his predecessors had made great gains there, and he had too. Indeed, the empire was at its greatest extent ever. In 1529, his ancestor Suleiman had even besieged the Habsburg capital of Vienna, and he would have taken it too, if not for an early winter. And though he had been a good custodian of the state, Mehmed knew his accomplishments didn't measure up to those storied ancestors. To truly live in history, he would have to do more than take further bites out of Ukraine. But Mehmed's Grand Vizier, Kara Mustafa Pasha, had an audacious plan. He too had something to prove. His family had served as viziers to the Ottoman sultans for a quarter century, and had helped the empire reach its current height. But Kara Mustafa was also adopted, and perhaps felt a need to prove himself worthy of his family legacy. So, he proposed that they outdo the sultan's namesake. The great Mehmed II had plucked the red apple of Constantinople, but they would finally pick the golden apple, the place that had evaded even the sultan's illustrious ancestors, Vienna. It was a bold plan, one that would humiliate the Habsburgs, seize their trade routes, and create a bastion to secure their territory in the Balkans, Hungary, and Ukraine. And though it was 
true that the city was a long way off? At the farthest limits of the empire striking distance, the prospect wasn't ludicrous. In fact, 1682 was the best time in a century to take Vienna. See, for the last two decades, the empires had been at peace, and Leopold had used that period of calm to refocus his military on guarding his western borders from French encroachment. The eastern sector was neglected, and Ottoman spies reported that more modern earthworks around Vienna crumbled from inattention. The city's stone wall was still medieval, its blocks held together by gravity rather than mortar, meaning the city's defense was akin to sort of a giant Jenga tower. Ottoman artillery only had to knock some blocks out, and the whole thing would come tumbling down. Heck, it sounds like Zoe could do that job if she was bored enough. Sorry, back to him. In addition, the deeply Catholic Habsburgs' brutal oppression of Protestants had unsettled their rule in Hungary. The Ottomans had long experience backing Protestant unrest, and some on the frontier even considered the Muslim Empire a more tolerant ruler than the Catholic Habsburgs. So if they marched on Vienna, Protestants would rally to their aid. So in G So we see again, <clears throat> this Christian-Muslim conflict has been going on for centuries. And you know, the only reason why I stop it and I start talking about it is because the, the people who talk about it now, especially where I am, they talk as if it's something new. They don't know the history of it. And I'll be honest, I didn't know the extent of the history of it until I started watching all these videos on YouTube. And especially, so thanks to you all suggesting this to me. You know what I mean? Suggesting all the videos and stuff like that. This stuff has been going on forever. And a lot of it seemed to have centered in that little part of the world with Ottomans and, you know, the, all these, these, uh, these, these people out there fighting. That seemed to have sort of dissipated and now it's mainly more political, as far as I could tell from my perspective. If I'm wrong, comment down in the, in the bottom down there, in, in, in the comment section. Uh, because I'm not there, so I don't know what is the relationship between the two religions in that region. Is there friction? You know what I mean? Or is uh, are most of the conflicts now politically based, or so, you know, over resources and power and stuff like that? Uh, it seems to be a lot, a little bit more peaceful than back then. Because I mean, there's so much politics going on. You know what I mean? Uh, this person's cousin and this cousin person's brother. We see that with the uh, with Vlad the Impaler. And here we go with the Ottomans again. Somebody said they ruled for centuries, so I guess that's why they keep coming up, you know? Comment down below, tell me if there's places to visit that, that have Ottoman influence still in it. I, I would like to, you know what I mean? Because they seem to be like one of the biggest powers of that whole medieval battle in times and all of that, you know what I mean? It would be cool to like walk where they have walked and know that you're walking where they have walked, not just guessing, you know? Like if there's monuments and places where things have happened during then or if those are gone now because it's changed so much, so much powers and, uh, and leadership and stuff it has changed so much there. Let's get back to the video here. January of 1682, Karl Mustafa formally declared war on the Holy Roman Empire. Austrian diplomats watched as two Janissaries planted horsehair standards outside the palace in Istanbul. It was an old tradition, one that recalled the Ottomans' origins as nomadic horse tribesmen migrating out of Central Asia. Because while Islamic, the Ottoman Turks had retained their distinct culture. And for centuries, this gesture meant to prepare for war. Wow. But in Vienna, Leopold and his ministers dismissed these reports. The real threat, they reasoned, was France. The Ottomans were planning some kind of frontier incursion, probably to take a few forts, or at most, cutting north to hit the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Meanwhile, the Ottoman army gathered. The corps came first. Elite horseback archers, levies from North Africa, Arabia, Egypt, and Anatolia. Oh, Huge wow. artillery pieces, a baggage train of camels, siege engineers, adept at tunneling below enemy walls and bringing them down with gunpowder charges, and the famous Janissaries. Elite assault troops drilled with swords and heavy bore muskets, each carrying a bag of grenades, spears of glass or clay encasing handfuls of powder. Once, long ago, Janissaries had been Christian children taken as a tithe, converted, and indoctrinated as soldiers. But now, they were a privileged class, and families jockeyed to place their sons in their ranks. Each unit was a sworn brotherhood, every man marked with a tattoo giving his serial number and unit designation. As the army marched out of the capital, 
the Janissary's supreme commander, the man whose tattoo was a simple number one, traveled with them. The they had tattoos back the then. Now, in the European imagination, Ottoman soldiers were a savage horde. But in truth, this army was organized down to the smallest detail. Every squad had a sleeping tent and a cooking pot. They had mobile latrine tents, enough food to sustain them for the whole campaign, and even designated cobblers. In fact, Ottoman military planners had calculated how long a Janissary could march before his shoes would need new soles. Talk about crossing eyes and dotting teeth. Oh, yeah. Both of which are not in the word shoes. But let's move on. As they moved into the frontier, Protestant levies joined them, their numbers swelling to 140,000. But when they reached Belgrade, the Sultan handed command to his Grand Vizier and turned back. Ceremonial deniability. If Kara Mustafa succeeded, the Sultan would take credit. But if he failed, the blame would be his alone. And it was only then, at the end of March 1683, that the Grand Vizier informed his officers of their target and sent a final declaration of war to Vienna. When the message arrived, Leopold realized he'd lost time dismissing the Ottoman threat. He dispatched diplomats to Jan III Sobieski, the King of Poland and the Grand Duke of Lithuania, proposing a mutual defense pact. The 54-year-old king, elected to the throne on the strength of his military record, readily agreed. Should the Turks attack Krakow, Vienna would send aid. And, you know, vice versa, not that they would ever dare. Still thinking Poland was the target, the emperor appointed his brother-in-law, Charles, Duke of Lorraine, as head of his army. Though an aristocrat, Charles was an experienced military officer, but also an eccentric one. He dressed in high fashion, but let his clothes wear out until they were stained and torn. His <laughs> wig literally rotted off his head, but he was also infamously durable. In his career, he'd survived head wounds, smallpox, and a nosedive off a bridge. To command Vienna's garrison, Leopold picked Count Ernst von Stachenberg, a man with an unremarkable military record, but a steely disposition that might come in handy. Yet the most important defender was not a duke or count, but a fabulously expensive... <coughs> George Rimbler was a German military engineer who'd written a treatise on fortress He He'd also faced the Ottomans before and knew their siege capabilities. For months, Rimbler worked day and night to modernize Vienna's crumbling outer earthworks, ditches, and revelants. Triangular platforms meant to funnel attackers into kill zones. Rimbler sunk pointed stakes into the earthworks to create fences and fighting platforms. And though simple, when wrecked by cannonballs or mines, these wooden palisades turned into debris fields that slowed or halted attacking infantry. Stone, by contrast, collapsed into easily scalable piles. And then came July 7th, the day. Now, the Ottomans seem to have a multicultural force because the people from Africa and people from Asia joined them. So you have to think that there were like mixings going on in there. Even when they invaded the places, they must have married local people. Which begs the the idea that I have that everybody's got a part of everybody in them. We have to, you know what I mean? Because with all the wars going on and all the different ethnicities and the different nationalities and, and all of that coming in, taking over and, you know, and the changing of the guards, especially in this region alone, in this region alone, you know what I mean? And, and the borders are just like so close to each other. Well, when I say close to each other, easily accessed to come in and do what you have to do. Like, for instance, okay, to invade America, they have to come out. If they come from Europe, they have to fly over, you know what I mean? Whereas they get on horseback, though it was tedious and treacherous, they still got there, and they still conquered, and they still ruled the people. And if it, <laughs> this is going to be a bad analogy, but the truth is, if we take it from anything from women these days, they like the bad boys. Some of them like the bad boys. A quite white bit of them like the bad boys. So you know what I mean? When these soldiers come in and they're like... The, the, the conquerors and stuff like that, I think them women and them, they go, oh, they romanticize the vibe, you know what I mean? You, you, you have the little Romeo and Juliet type vibe going on. I love him, you know. And I'm trivializing, but you, you see what I'm trying to say here. So, of course, there was mixing. So, I'm assuming in that region, those people are really mixed up with different types of people. What separated them? 
Now, some ethnicities, I guess, stayed in 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 in, in, uh, in uh, intact, and you could tell the difference, which is really odd because you know they they, they all pretty much have the same skin tone. Some a little bit darker, you know. Some a little bit lighter, but you know, you, but they could tell the difference. But then again, when you come to think about it, I could tell the difference between an African American and a real African. Yeah, I could tell the difference in the way they walk. I could tell the difference in the way their their, their personality and their attitude towards life is. I could just tell the difference, you know. And a lot of people uh, wonder how I could do that, but I can. I could also tell the difference to a certain degree with the different countries in South America. Uh, by the way the, the attitude and stuff is but anyway let's let's get back to this I'm just just pontificating a little bit too late. far too late the vet Leopold realized Vienna was the target panic gripped the district the city's nobles fled along with the emperor 60,000 of the city's wealthy took to the road replaced by refugees from the countryside Ribbler and Stockenberg madly tried to finish the defenses torching the city's outskirts to clear a field of fire. <coughs> Charles took the army into a blocking position, but he underestimated the Ottoman speed. By the time he deployed, the dust plumes of enemy cavalry were already behind him. He fought his way clear and sent the infantry to bolster the city's defenses, spiriting his cavalry into the woods, hoping to keep Vienna's supply lines open. And on July 14th, the Ottomans arrived at Vienna. Two days later, Cavalry stormed the smoking outskirts of the city, throwing back the defenders and securing a base of operations, a place for Kara Mustafa to draw up his artillery. On the walls, Vienna defenders saw smoke jet from the line of cannons. Pencil lines appeared in the sky, the arc of incoming cannon fire. Then behind them, the crack of lead on stone. Broken glass coughed outward. A church steeple crumbled. Then another. Any high tower, any house that poked above the earth fortifications became a target. Vienna was burning, and there was nothing to do but hold. Wow, this is a quite in, intriguing. Uh, I think it's a series, so I think there's three videos of it. I'll, I'll be watching all three of them, but... Uh, and this is new here because they're speaking of Vienna now, you know what I mean? I don't think I've had any of the videos that I watched specifically talk about Vienna in the 1600s and thing. I hope you guys are enjoying this with me. I'll leave a link in the description for this video. I'll also leave a link to the series on a historical series. Uh, the, oh man, what do you call it? Uh, not the series, the... Uh, Anyway, I'll, I'll leave it in the link here so you can go in and, and binge watch the stuff, you know, see what's going on there. It's, uh, hope you guys are having a great day. You know, you're all taking care of yourself, just taking care of each other, and life is cool, right? It's all right.